Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Geological Society Roundtable on the UK government's recently published Critical Mineral Strategy. Uh, as Amelia said, my name is Nick Garner. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of St Andrews. I'm also the lead for the Society's Energy Transition theme. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by four of the geoscientists who were part of the Critical Minerals Expert Committee and who were therefore intricately involved in the crafting of the Critical Minerals Strategy over the past year. They very kindly agreed to give up their lunch hour to share their experiences and thoughts uh, and with, with, with us today. And so in no particular order, I'd like to welcome, first of all, uh, Dr. Sarah Gordon, the CEO of Satala and co-founder of Responsible Raw Materials, whose expertise covers mining and risk, uh, environmental and social governance be and beyond. Um, Professor Richard Harrington of the Natural History Museum, I think you've just stepped down as head, so you've uh, got a bit more time for research and is an expert in critical metals formation and sustainability and currently a co-investigator on the NERC funded consortium LIFT Lithium for Future Technology. Uh, in the same room, I think Dr. Karen Hanghoi, uh, director of the British Geological Survey, who has extensive experience in research and innovation in both academia and in the mining and metals industry. And also Professor Francis Wall, professor of applied mineralogy at the Camden School of Mines in Cornwall, who has a background in rare earth deposits and currently leads the Metfotech Circular Economy Center for Technology Metals. I'm also joined by Dr. Megan O'Donnell, the Head of Policy and Communications at the Geological Society, and I will ask them to further introduce themselves and give some initial thoughts shortly, but I thought I should just give some uh, context for, for why we're holding this round table. So the, uh, the Critical Minerals Strategy was published in July 1920, uh, 2022, not 1922, and this was the result of a lengthy consultation process run by Bayes, the uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, during which representatives from academia, industry, finance, policy and beyond discussed the nature of critical mineral supply chains and how the UK could increase its resilience in critical minerals in the context of the energy transition and other technologies with a new focus on domestic supply and investment, training, skills, and research required to underpin this. And the UK is one of many countries worldwide who are currently looking at this topic. So the aim of today is to discuss the motivations behind the strategy, the process of crafting the strategy, and then drill into the outcomes specifically as it relates to the geosciences. And throughout, if you have any questions, then please type them into the chat window as, as we go along, and we will endeavor to answer them uh, uh, and to get your answers for them. So firstly, Megan, um, would you like to give an overview of the society's role in this, please? I'd love to, thanks so much, Nick. Um, so as Nick said, I'm Megan O'Donnell, I'm the Head of Policy and Communications here at the Geological Society. And as the National Forum for Debate and Development of Cutting Edge Earth Science, the Society has a special responsibility to communicate this science to the public, to the media, and to the government itself. Our policy team, um, are responsible for this within the society. And so myself and Katie Jones, our policy and communications officer, do this on behalf of the geoscience community. We do this by communicating geological information to support evidence-based policy making, hosting and attending policy relevant, relevant meetings, such as this one, um, supporting our members in communicating their expertise with policymakers and communicating the value and importance of geoscience knowledge. Um, in, and, in education and in policy making. And so uh, I'm delighted to join Nick today in supporting him with some of the technicalities of this webinar and, and even more so delighted that the members of the um, Critical Minerals Expert Committee could join us today to talk about this uh, strategy, the UK's first of this kind, um, and its relevance for both policy and for the geoscience community. So that's enough from me and I'll hand back to Nick. Thanks Megan, thanks. So we thought it was probably worth saying up front exactly what a critical mineral is. So uh, Francis has kindly agreed to, to, to help educate us on this. Thank you very much, Nick. So I hope I'm sharing slides uh, now. You just all disappeared as I began from my screen. So <laughs> no, back again. Right, so yes, a couple of slides then here for people who might, might be new to this topic to talk about what a critical mineral is. And the first thing to say is it there's, uh, it's absolutely not about one particular type of mineral might be critical, say a particular type of cobalt mineral is critical and another sort of cobalt mineral isn't critical. This is all about raw materials. So don't really worry too much about the terms metals, minerals or materials. They're often used interchangeably when we're talking about critical 
um, materials overall. And so this is an agenda set by manufacturing industry. It's about the raw materials that they need for the things that they're making. And those raw materials might be on the first time round, you know, mined new materials, or they might come on a second life from recycling. But that doesn't really matter. It's about what's available. And so then a critical raw material has two things. And this is the classic kind of graph that I've, I've got here on this slide. First of all, it has to be reasonably economic important in its context, which could be and usually as a country or a group of countries like the European Union, but it could be a company or a region, you can calculate criticality in any context you like. So it has to be reasonably economically important and that it, um, it's difficult to substitute that there's some reason why you particularly need that material. So maybe lithium is a good example. Lithium ion batteries, you can't make batteries without lithium. You can choose maybe some of the other materials, but lithium has to be there, right? So it has to have that importance. And that's our X axis on this graph. You can have your graph either way around. And then the other thing is this measure of, is there a potential supply shortage? And so this often means that maybe there's just one or two countries in the world that either dominate mining, because these things are normally not very well recycled, or dominates the second stage of processing. And that means that if they were to stop producing, then there would be a crisis for the manufacturers who need these materials. And I think this has really come about this agenda because we're so clever at manufacturing things with all kinds of different elements in the periodic table these days. And now, if you've been looking at that graph, you see it's a delightful graph. It has no units, and you can set the threshold wherever you like. And so uh, basically you plot on there your the characteristics of the material, I'll show you that in a second, but just to say that this is set by the people who are doing these calculations. And, and there's a whole science in the calculation of criticality, um, which we don't have time to go into today, but uh, you could ask a question on that if you wanted to. And I wanted to go right back over 10 years to 2011. This is a nice graph from the Department of Energy in the United States to show they were thinking about that with respect to how are their future energy, especially clean energy, going to be generated? What materials would they need for manufacturing? And if you translate that from that previous graph, actually, this is the other way around. So the importance of clean energy is on the y axis. The supply risk, so whether it's dominate, whether supply is dominated by a couple of countries is on the x-axis. And then if you look at the highest critical thing in these uh, elements, dysprosium, europium, terbium, which are the heavy rare earth, so very, um, you know, unusual elements, if you like, needed in very small quantities. And I think that's an important point. Iron ore doesn't get on your critical list because there's so much of it used all the time from very many different sources. But things that are very specialist are more likely to be there. And then I wanted to point out lithium, which really wasn't on the critical list at the time. And just to say, therefore, that critical lists are time dependent. They're context dependent and time dependent. They will change over time. And here are the 18 that the UK now has on our critical list calculated by the British Geological Survey. So you can just leave that up for a couple of seconds for you to have a look and see what's there. And I wanted to make the point that this agenda has been growing over the last 10 years. And each time the calculation goes around, often more elements seem to get put in the critical category. And we might discuss whether it's good or bad for elements to be in the critical category. I would say for geologists, it's been a wonderful agenda for waking the whole community of government and funders up to the, to the idea of raw materials, which they'd forgotten all about. For a manufacturer, though, remember, this is not good if the material you need is vulnerable to supply disruption. And this is my periodic table of criticality then. And the things in the pinky color are on the EU list only. The things in yellow are on the USA list of critical minerals only. And the green is both. And then I've added on top of that the 18. Most of them for Britain coincide with the American or the European Union list. And if they're a little bit different, they're only on one of the lists like silicon here, I've put them in, uh, in the green bold color. And I think the point I want to make with this agenda is as time has gone on, the number of critical minerals has gone up. And 
have a look there, that covers almost all of the periodic table, doesn't it? And this is, you know, a feature of our manufacturing. And the only thing that never seems to get on there is copper, which maybe is arguably the most important metal for the energy transition, but again, a major metal with lots of different sources. So there we are, that's my introduction then, which I hope is useful to what a critical mineral is. Thanks, Francis. That's really useful. Good to see Tim made it. My tin hat on. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, that's, uh, and I guess it's also worth outlining why why do we need a strategy? So we talked about what a critical mineral is, but why why was this effort put together to to make a strategy? And I was going to ask maybe Richard whether you could give us a bit of a background on that. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Th thanks, Francis, for the um, the background to that. Oh, I think we've got a bit of echo here. I'm sorry. Hopefully, we've uh, we've remedied that. Yeah. Well, the government obviously, like a lot of the world, are committed to a net zero strategy, uh, which is demanding that we decarbonize our uh, industry. And of course, you know, it, it means that those particular metals that Francis talked about are amongst those that are needed. And we need a stable supply of those. We need to secure the supply chains. And Francis talked about the vulnerability. So really without a government strategy, um, we're gonna end up trying to decarbonize our industry, like the car industry, which is really important to the UK, producing you know, over a million cars a year. If we can't get those materials to our factories in the UK uh, and, and manufacture, then we're gonna lose our car industry. So you can see why the government is particularly keen to have a, a strategy. Um, and as part of that, really, we can start to secure those supply chains. We can, we can actually look at uh, sovereign capability, i.e., you know, how much of those materials could come from the UK, how much can come from different supply chains that can get secured. And there's jobs and the, you know, the regional, regionality of jobs and, and growth comes into that too. So it's really in the government's interest to make sure that when we decarbonize industry and change, that we can secure all of those metals. And if we don't have a policy to understand how that might happen, uh, we could get ourselves into a, uh, into a mix. And it, it then gives the government an opportunity to stimulate areas that will secure those particular minerals for, for UK PLC. So that's in a nutshell, really, why we we need a strategy, I think. Great, thanks, Richard. That's that's a really good overview. Um, just to remind the, the the audience, so you can put Q and A's in the in the uh, textbox at any point, and we will endeavour to, to answer your questions. But I thought it'd be useful if we went around the panel and asked for sort of a two minute reaction and summary of 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 what you thought was published over the summer, and maybe if you could give a little bit more uh, detail about your background and involvement. So let's start with Karen, then. Sarah, back to Francis and Richard, and we'll do it in, in that order. So Karen, if, if you could kick us off, please. Yeah, so, so thank you. Um, thank you, Nick. And thank you, uh, Francis and Richard, for sort of setting the scene. I think that if I, if I just start out with commenting a little bit on, on, on what uh, Francis and Richard said, I think that Francis sort of put her, her finger right on it when she says, you know, why are we even talking about criticality? Because some things that were that are critical today weren't critical a few years ago it might change tomorrow it's a very dynamic thing it depends on your point of view what kind of industry you are if you're a car industry or manufacturing of mobile phones and criticality in itself is actually completely uninteresting so that's why we need a strategy because it's about what kind of actions we need to take to make sure that nothing in a perfect world nothing is critical we can get all of the things we need when we need them and sourced in a sustainable way and uh, and 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 we've talked about criticality now for the last you showed the the figures francis for the last uh, more than a decade and frankly, we haven't actually made much progress on this. We've acknowledged the importance of it, and we have spent a lot of time discussing criticality, but we haven't actually spent a lot of time discussing what are we going to do about it. And that is what we're discussing now. And I think it's very timely, and it's a very, very interesting discussion. And one thing perhaps I wanted to add is that the there is actually a UK mineral strategy, not a critical mineral strategy, but a mineral strategy that dates back a few years. 
And, uh, and the second version of that strategy is actually due to come out. And that is a strategy that's written not by government, but by uh, industry associations, because the UK actually has a very large mineral industry already that, it, that is aware of all of the dynamic pressures that you get in the, in the mineral market. And again, back to Francis, things that aren't thought about as critical might become critical in the future. So it's important to have a strategy that actually is broader than just the minerals that we perceive to be critical today. So I think that is a big challenge. And that is one of the things that we have spent some time discussing in, the, uh, in this uh, expert panel uh, that, uh, that BASE have used to develop the strategy. So we've had players from many different sectors, also players who are perhaps from, uh, are interested in copper. As, as Francis says, it's, it's not critical, but it's extremely important. And so understanding that difference between what's important and what's critical, because it's not the same thing, is really uh, has been part of the discussion going into developing this strategy. And, uh, and I'm sure someone's gonna say something about the strategy. I could say a little bit about it, but I think I'll probably be quiet for a little bit, let someone else uh, talk. But basically the strategy is looking at the different things that we have to do to make sure that things stop being critical. And that is very, very important. I'll be quiet now. So I think then um, following your order that you, uh, you, you placed upon us, Nick, um, just to build on um, what, Kath, um, what Karen has just said. So actually, yes, whilst the strategy is called the critical mineral strategy, we'd be quite happy to lose that critical word um, and call it the mineral strategy. But then that would get very confusing with regards to other documents that are out there. The other thing to note is that this is the critical mineral strategy for the UK. So a lot of us, for example, um, the, the, all of us who are here on the call today, we work with organizations all over the world. And I think we spend most of our time thinking about things in a global sense. So one thing for me that I found quite interesting was, OK, now we're thinking about this as security of supply for the United Kingdom. So what does that look like? Where do we get these materials from? Now, of course, we've got some in the rocks beneath our own feet from a domestic supply perspective, and that the strategy pulls out various items that perhaps need to be addressed to alleviate challenges with regards to our own domestic supply. But then from a UK perspective, we've got huge strengths and leadership with regards to mining companies, for example, being listed in London and the flow of money going into the mining sector. So that then allows us to say, okay, well, yep, yeah, we can source some of these materials at home, but we also can go away. And then with that, we have strengths in the form of our corporate governance codes and um, um, various different attributes with regards to sustainability and ESG requirements and different regulations. So what that then means is that from a UK perspective, when we're looking to source these materials from abroad or from home, that they need to come with those ESG credentials. And so it's a case there of really looking at human rights, for example, in the sourcing of those different materials that are needed for batteries, et cetera. So what does that look like? And what does that look like through the eyes of, of being British? The final aspect here as well is, of course, we're not just talking about the primary raw materials. Also, we're talking about the circular economy. And I'm sure that Francis will come on to this in a second. Um, but just to steal some of Francis's thunder, it's a case here, sorry, Francis, of it's not all about just digging things out of the ground. It's actually about showing those minerals and those metals and those elements respect and saying, we've gone to all that effort of responsibly extracting you from the ground. Now let's look after you. And yes, I am personifying <laughs> minerals and metals, but hey, I'm a geologist, so we all talk to rocks. And saying, okay, well, how can we keep you in circulation? And that's something where... There's a huge amount of work that needs to be done to up the levels of recycling, also change the way in which we are designing our technology so it can be more durable, so it can be pulled apart and more easily reused. So all of this then allows us to say, okay, from a British perspective, we are never going to source all the materials we need from the rocks beneath our own feet. We need to engage in international trade. We need to 
impose our own expectations on that from a sustainability perspective, for example. And then we need to say, well, hang on, we've got a huge amount of material in stock in the UK at the moment. Instead of sending all of that waste abroad to be recycled or thrown away somewhere else, actually, let's see that as a resource in its own right. And how can we make more use of that? So finally, just to pass across to Frances, having stolen a whole load of her thunder, but I know that she has more. One of the things that I really enjoyed from being a part or still being a part of this group was the diversity of perspectives and people who came together from across the full value chain of raw materials in its circular form, but also from a diverse, diversity of backgrounds. So we're all geo. Oh, I think I think Sarah's scientists, oh, you're back. but in that advisory group, we had lawyers. Oh, did I disappear? My sincere apologies. So with that, I shall pass across to to Francis. Yeah, we'll come back to the group again. In a minute. Mm -hmm. Shall I go then? Nick can yeah. do my. Uh, right. With the, the clever people at Bayes who actually wrote the strategy, then if you're trying to think, you know, how do I get all of this, this long document in my head all in one go, they came up with the ACE part of it, which makes it easy to remember. So the ACE is A for accelerate, C for collaborate, and E for enhance. And so that's the three parts. So let me quickly go through and say how they apply to what I'm particularly interested in and what I'm doing. So the Accelerate was to accelerate in the UK how it can sort out its own raw materials. And that might be minerals in the ground. So I'm sitting here in Cornwall and we're a hotspot for exploration for technology metals at the moment. And so the strategy is really important in giving a green light for government backing. It wasn't really important giving any funding to anybody, I'd like to say. There wasn't any money directly attached. So when you read the document, it won't say, and we've immediately put this amount of money up for grabs for anybody who wants it. There are some initiatives like the Critical Minerals Intelligence Centre that came alongside the Net Zero Strategy 2 at BGS, which is you know, absolutely funded. But mainly, I would say that this signaling has been more important than I might have expected in actually in helping people. So I think that's an interesting lesson. So people anywhere in the UK now who are exploring for minerals have help that there's a strategy that talks about and names them. And then Sarah already talked about a bit about circular economy. And I think this is really important. We need a lot more of the materials for making clean technologies, whether that's lithium, cobalt, rare earths, or the usual suspects these uh, strange elements that we don't know much about, we need a lot more of them to flow into our manufacturing and then into our economy. And once we've got them, we'd better jolly well learn how to look after them much better than we have been doing in the past. And so that's what we take as our circular economy view. We need a whole new technology metals economy for these things. And there is a UKRI initiative called the NICER program. And we have a center in that for technology metals, which has the acronym met for tech And so the strategy is really important for that. We fed in to the strategy from our research as far as we've got in met for tech and we'll be helping Bayes, offering to help Bayes and feed things back into them as part of our research in that whole systems looking after the metals. And that means this geoscientists, we need to work with material scientists, with chemists, with social sciences, with business specialists, with engineers, et cetera. It's really a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary effort. So that's the A. The C is all about collaborating and the raw materials we need from overseas. So that's great if you, uh, you, know, if you have connections overseas, things like rare earths, the only recycling are our deposits in, in the UK, the original deposits, the world-class ones are overseas. And I think we might see more money, hopefully, <laughs> for collaborations with overseas partners flowing from maybe UKRI, uh, you know, signaled from the strategy. So there's no not the money direct it with from Bayes with the strategy, but coming from other sources. So that's C. And then enhance, you know, Sarah already talked about this, is how can the UK, with its power in the London finance industry, especially, how can we really lead responsible sources? because we haven't said the China word yet. So let me say China, <laughs> I've thought of it. They are so far ahead, everybody, you know, in, uh, in, in 
mining, in manufacturing, all the way through the value chain with what, what the rest of the world therefore end up calling critical materials because China is dominant. If there's one country that's dominant in more raw materials than any other, it's absolutely China. And if they have one thing that they haven't been so good at, it's their environmental performance. And so if anybody wants to compete at all, we have to do that at the top of environmental, social and governance and, and economic performance. And so that's a green light, I think, for working hard on that, the enhanced part. And you know, we've been doing things with the new United Nations Resource Management System to try and contribute to that too. Right, I think that's quite enough and I should hand over to Richard. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the others for, for filling in practically everything that covered, <laughs> except no, there are a few things actually, which I, I'd like to comment on. One of the, we, the learnings from this exercise, actually we, we did do a deep a deepish dive on what the UK is really strong on. And I think Sarah alluded to the fact that things like ESG was strong and Francis talked about, you know, some of the manufacturing, but we also, we didn't talk about chemists and, and processing. And I think that's something that the UK historically is, was pioneering and, and really good at, but we, we, we learned that we're still good at that, but we kind of need to harness our expertise there and, and make sure we keep building capacity. So of course that has implications for geoscience, needing scientists along that supply chain to help with all the types of materials, not only the, the newly mined materials, but quite a lot of the waste effectively is a, is a, is a new type of, uh, of ore and actually needs to be uh, needs the level of science on those is, has to be even more more clever really than, than just going and mining in the raw because we're in the position actually that some of the materials they're cheaper to go out and mine them in the in, in, in a new site than they are to, to recycle materials and that can't be good we've got to be able to make sure we use those materials the precious things as Sarah said that we've already taken out of the ground Another lesson learned, I think, was that policies clearly need to be for the long term. Um, I don't want people to start chuckling about how long can we have a policy lasting for, because we had a, an industrial policy that, that that got torn up, and which uh, and we, we need to make sure that there's a policy following this strategy that is going to be there for 2050. We're committed to delivery of decarbonising, and we need to make sure that whatever comes out of this strategy is, is adhered to, to, to be able to deliver those real things and rather, uh, you know, rather than just kind of uh, take a few things and, and do things now that then don't get followed through. And I, I think that leads then on to some policy topics where we, we need to, we've come out, we need to support some of those areas that we're strong at. I talked to you about metallurgy, you know, recycling and so on. Uh, we, should, we, we can be leaders on minimising waste in mining projects. We've got all that techniques, techniques. And then the last thing I really want to flag is the geo-bio interface. And this goes into the sort of environmental side of things. We had at COP26, uh, and it, indeed it will be writ large in COP27, how important the, the footprint of any kind of intervention by humans is. It's got to be nature positive. And... As the UK, we can be really strong in building that geo-bio uh, combination that makes sure that all of the, whatever the uh, ways of recovering our metals, whether they are from recycling or from new mining, that that, that legacy is, is net nature positive. And I think that's where, we, as they, people were saying, we, we've got a strategy, we need now to have some implementation. And we're looking now to government, hopefully, to put resource into some of that you know, creating an enabling environment for that strategy to come forward, strengthening international partnerships we heard about. And then the other thing is de-risking viable projects. So some projects get stalled because, you know, they're incredibly risky, but maybe the government has a role of kind of de-risking that. To bring projects to market earlier on, support projects with sort of offtake agreements, particularly for things that we really need for our own industry, like car manufacturing and so on. Um, and we need to be able to have an implementation that gives investors confidence to commit in the UK to providing those materials and be they locally sourced, so therefore an environment that would allow us to mine in Cornwall in a way that is, is, is engaging with the, the local communities as well as delivering something net positive for nature. 
and that will need government intervention, I, I feel. So we're looking really tailing a strategy into some kind of implementation. Um, and that's really my kind of two penny worth. Great, thanks Richard. Thanks all, that, that's really useful. Um, I think it's probably worth uh, just quickly touching, um, you know, why, why was it formed? Why was Bayes involved? Um, was that driven by geoscience, by industry, et cetera? Uh, Sarah, maybe this is something you could give us a bit of a brief background in. Yeah, so I mean, I think it was something where back back this time last year at COP26, uh, some of us uh, were lucky enough to go on behalf of the Geological Society. So uh, thanks for sorting all of, of that out. It was brilliant to go. Um, and whilst inside the event, it was quite different inside, I think, compared to how the media portrayed it outside of the event. But inside the event, yep, everyone was excited about the targets that were being set. Um, but nobody was talking about where these raw materials were going to come from for wind turbines, photovoltaics, electric vehicles, etc. And I think the only time that the word mining was mentioned was in conjunction with coal. And so it was a, a nasty, evil, wicked word. Um, and as somebody who has worked in the mining sector for quite a long time, I was obviously seriously offended by this. But I think what that then set the platform for, and there were an awful, there was an awful lot of chatter going around the edge of all of this. There were papers that were written by, for example, the Critical Minerals Association. There were a number of other papers that were written and sent to government. Um, I think it was almost something where it got to a, a critical mass where the government went, hang on, we do actually have a gap within this. Um, and allegedly these papers landed on Boris Johnson's desk and he went, whoa, who's supposed to be dealing with it? Because there was quite some confusion perhaps within government as to who was supposed to pick this up. And it was allocated to Bayes to take the leadership position. Now, I think actually this teed us up very nicely because what it meant was that it pulled together or Bayes pulled together a cross Whitehall group. And what that means is that they pulled in multiple different departments. Um, and so all the acronyms can get used here, DIT, FCDO, et cetera, everybody coming together to say, well, well, what do we think we should be doing with regards to critical materials? Um, and that, of course, then spurned the, the need for the advisory group that, again, was very multidisciplinary with regards to that. So I think it was something which was a long time coming. But through COP26, the fact that mining wasn't spoken about, the fact that the UK went, hang on, we've got a problem here, that perhaps gave us the acceleration that was needed to say, OK, now let's do something about it. Thanks, Nick. Great. No, thanks, Sarah. That's really helpful. And I, um, I want to jump in and also yes. say COVID. Eh? Maybe not much good comes out of a pandemic, but understanding the importance of supply chains was really one of them. And First of all, it was obviously medical equipment. And then very quickly, that expanded to looking at other supply chains, including the, the critical minerals, the minerals that we need for clean tech manufacturing. And I think that came from the Department for International Trade. And then it went to the cabinet office. And there was a lot of yeah. very good research done um, from the cabinet office there. And then as then it then it links up with Sarah's story and went to Bayes, who convened and so when, when we go to these meetings I think it's noticeable that there are people who we, we've come to know now from lots of government departments including DEFRA there we are there's another acronym to mention this afternoon they're very much involved <laughs> as well so and they and they do you know they all come and listen and take part in it so I, I think it's really picked up it's a very different world to previous times when we've heard this agenda be picked up in government and then it's you know gone away again quite quickly from the front line it did really get high enough we even had a critical minerals minister <laughs> for a short time <laughs> unfortunately that wasn't a very long time <laughs> these days and I don't think we've got one now have we I don't know if anybody knows oh we have oh Richard's going to tell us who it is because I didn't know we even had one again now Richard you're muted yes it's um Oh, sorry, Karen. We have a little bit of a, um, of a dual computer problem here. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the the current minister for both actually for science uh, and for minerals in the um, in base is uh, Nusrat Ghani, who was appointed, I want to say about uh, a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, that that rumor has it that she has already uh, been briefed quite a bit on the minerals in this, and is very, very interested in the, uh, in the minerals item. 
Great, thanks, Karen. Um, so I think given the time and given the sort of meat, is it really talking about the implications for geosciences? We, we should sort of move on to that, really. Um, so the main outcome. So maybe, Karen, we, we can keep keep you unmuted and, and you could talk to us about, you know, what, what do you feel is is really important that's come out of it for geosciences and what are what are the next steps that you'd like to see? That's a very big question. I think, I mean, as, as Francis pointed out sort of early on, this is um, this is a great attention maker. This is something that that everyone almost has heard about now. There's been great media coverage about critical uh, minerals, not just in the UK, but pretty much across the world. So, so in, in that sense, uh, it is a window of opportunity as well to show how geoscience is part of the solution to this. And that goes both from the the rock, you know, understanding what's what's in the rock and how can we perhaps get it out. Uh, but also, as pointed out before, you know, looking at, at, at gadgets like this one, as a, that this is a rock too, we can describe this as a resource. Uh, it has a grade, it has a tonnage, it has a, an occurrence. And so we are actually the best, we can't do it alone, but we are very, very importantly uh, placed in being able to, to actually get the information together that we need to make the solutions to all of this. And I'll actually say one thing perhaps that I'd like to stress that we haven't talked about, one of the things that's in the, in the strategy that we're trying to do is that, that the UK has, has now also formed a critical minerals intelligence center, which is uh, it's a based at BGS, but it's really sort of a hub for a collaborative effort in trying to really stay on top of this. And that is where I think geoscience is gonna be very important because we need to, it's very dynamic. We have a critical minerals list now. It was made pretty quickly, which is actually the answer to many of the questions that I've seen pop into the Q&A. There was a sort of limited time and limited scope for how we thought about criticality initially, but it's never a finished piece of work. As soon as you have a list, the day after you've made the list, it's already obsolete, or maybe not entirely obsolete, but you actually need to continue to monitor and observe, and you can use the knowledge that you get from that to forecast what you think is going to happen, which again, you can use to uh, forecast what you need to do in terms of policy actions. And another very important thing, so that's one thing that is, I think, uh, really going to make a difference for the, for the geoscience involvement into, into this. The other thing that's very clear outcome of the strategy is to educate uh, much, much more and much, much better in this area. And it's been an area, and this has also been in the q and I saw, it's been an area that's been deprioritized, not just in the UK, but again, across the world. No one wants to teach uh, barely economic geology, but certainly not metallurgy or mining engineering and all those kinds of things. We've seen it fall off the curriculum everywhere. And it needs to come back on the curriculum and the UK government has made a commitment to do that, and that is potentially a huge transformer for for geosciences, I think, in the UK, because if we want that sustainability, if we want that kind of holistic approach to really finding the right solutions, we need smart people who are there for the right reasons and hopefully we can um, we can get that. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I mean, as someone who works in the, the university sector, you know, we, we, we do feel obviously training is, is really, really important. Um, I'm going to pass to Megan now. I think there are some questions that are related to that on the chat. Yeah, there are. I'm going to try and group a couple together. So apologies if you don't hear your question read out word for word. But um, I guess on the back of what you were saying about the difficult difficulty of defining critical, keeping up with what critical is and reflecting the changes in the sort of sector and the needs uh, uh, and the strategy. Um, some people were asking questions around what, what are the implications of international criticality lists differing? That's sort of one question. And how might that change the approach the UK needs to take? Um, as well as that, there was questions or reflections around what are the benefits and drawbacks of something being defined as critical? So quite a few questions around, I guess, the, just the definition part, which I think it would be really nice to touch on in a little bit more detail. Um, and also about those important but not critical minerals and materials. So what about all those minerals and materials that aren't on this criticality list? Where's the strategy for them? I know that you, you, you know a couple of people said, actually, it would be great if this was just 
the mineral strategy. Um, so how are those those other materials and minerals being factored into the government's thinking and what, what are the plans there? What, what does the sector need to be aware of? Um, and then I'll follow that up with another question about skills, maybe if you let me. Okay, uh, Richard, would you like to have a go at that? Yeah, oh, yeah, thanks. I mean, the, I think the, the, there's a really good question there about what are the things that are not on the critical list, because actually, if you look at the the, the energy transition, is there's huge amounts of copper, as Francis talked about, but iron ore, you know, aluminium, uh, silicon for, uh, and these are, the, the big challenges there are that these are things that are very energy intensive for processing. So I think we've, We've got to work, there should be a strategy for those because they're definitely linked into there's some of the biggest uh, problems for us from a, for decarbonizing, you know, particularly cement, which is used, you know, just every wind turbine has to be, well, not, except the floating ones has to be cemented, but, you know, hydro dams using cement increased, uh, you know, the, the amount of those kind of materials has, is, is going to be increased by our use. So we've, We've got to be having a strategy for that because we're going to have to look at other ways of defraying the carbon footprints of those probably um the thing about it's, that's a very interesting one about you know different countries might have different criticality indices and very much you know if you look at the uk we need to work out what it is we want our industry to look like and this is why i think i, I don't want to get political but having something like an, um, uh, an indus industry strategy would then help us to define what are the, root, the, the critical elements. And I think we have done that. This And that, that BGS uh, report is, is a really good one for where we are now. But we need to kind of link that into our industries, I think, and, and work out where is it that the UK is going to be really making a difference. And therefore, because some of those critical minerals, maybe we... As a, as a country they're critical but they're not very big to our economy and i think we we we, we need to do a further piece of work there but i would just stress that the non-critical but absolutely essential minerals need to be looked at as well and we that's why karen talked about that that uk uh mineral strategy because actually that employs you know, about 4.3 million jobs rely on the extractives in the UK and a lot of that sort of sand and gravel and other things, really important. And I think the G, the total GVA of that on the 2018 report was something like 235 billion pounds. So that's really big for the UK economy. And, and so um, I like Karen's idea of getting rid of that critical word because these are essential things and I think the strategy is needed for those as well. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Richard. I think, Karen, you, you want to say a few follow-up comments? Yeah, I think that, you know, around this this table, which isn't really a table, but, uh, but we're pretending that it is, around this table, uh, there's not going to be a lot of disagreement on, on that, that, that criticality has... I mean, it's it's gotten a lot of traction in in politics, and again, this is across the uh, across the globe, and so there's been a big appetite to include the word critical because it's been a, it's been an enabler in a way to get it on the agenda, but in reality, I think we would all kind of prefer to talk about what's actually important in society and what isn't, and many many minerals are. I want to just briefly touch on the list uh, because it's a list that BGS did. Uh, in connection with with base developing the strategy and base asked us to make the list uh, to help inform the strategy and it was discussed in this expert group as well so there's very little time to do the list that's the first thing i want to say because because of the the timing of the strategy but there was also an acknowledgement that it's not it's never going to be a final list we'll make a list and we'll continue to uh, to monitor and keep it alive but we had sort of certain criteria because there are lots of questions about why is copper not on there and why is uh, why is this element on there and why isn't this element on there that sort of thing because we all have in in our you know we all have a gut feeling of what we think is important and again it critical is not the same as important so what we did and i'm just very briefly going to say this you can you can download this report on our website it's 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 freely available and you can see exactly how we did it and what data we used because the important thing from our point of view was to use 
data so that it was a well informed list that could be reproduced by someone who was going to use the same criteria. So the really important thing is what criteria do you choose and what threshold do you choose? And Francis touched on that. And basically, we used uh, we used nine criteria in uh, in making the list for uh, for the UK critical minerals list, and we basically had uh, we had for each critical or for each material that we looked at as a candidate, we looked at, at production concentration. This is, is it all in China or isn't it? Companion metal fraction and recycling rates, recycling was part of it. We looked at uh, six other indicators that are production evolution, price volatility, substitutability, global trade concentration, UK import reliance, and UK gross value added contribution. So basically we went out and tried to find the best possible data for those nine categories. And then we scored them and then we selected the threshold uh, together with this, uh, with this expert group. There could be other ways of doing it. This is very close to how the USGS is doing it for the UK and or sorry for the US and a little bit different than what the European Commission is doing for Europe. But in essence, as Francis said in the beginning, we all sort of do this in the same way, but we're trying to, to tailor it to our society and our and our industry. And then I'm gonna to try to be quiet and give over to, or give back to you, Nick. Thanks, yeah, sorry, I'm just cognizant of the time. Um, so I want to go, come back to you, Francis, if I may, and, and also really get back to the issue, sort of, issue of skills. There's a number of questions where people you know, mentioned that Berkeley College, for example, has pushed out an anti-mining um, statement that, um, you know, us in universities know that we struggle to recruit geoscientists, but we know that they're quite important. And obviously you're at Camel School of Mines, so maybe you can say something about training and what came out of the strategy and where we need to go. Yes, with. well, of course, the strategy did actually give a name check to Camborne School of Mines. And that was because, you know, this skills agenda is so important if we're going to produce more minerals in the UK or collaborate with overseas or enhance the responsible sourcing of minerals and recycled materials from all over the world. You need the skills to do it. And of course, that's a very wide skill set. It's a real multidisciplinary skill set, including absolutely geoscientists. We're really important. And the reason why Cambon School of Mines got a particular name check is we're the last people actually training mining engineers. So how do you actually get the stuff out of the ground and then doing the mineral processing only we have those degrees and we're mainly teaching at postgrad now we're just setting up a new degree apprenticeship to get our undergraduate back again so our numbers have dwindled so low that uh, we've changed to a slightly different form of degree and now it was fantastic that the government said they would work with the Camborne School of Mines you know to get that mining engineering education going again and so I think what can we contribute from the universities we really need to make sure that we're producing the right skill set that the industry wants and it wants you know all these very multidisciplinary people all ready to talk in the right way to all kinds of different disciplines as well as the straightforward you know geology core geology skills for us as geoscientists so they've got to be and you know we obviously got to um, produce our mining engineers very holistic people who can do all kinds of things besides just ordinary mining as well I think for the for the future and so I think this is important and around that of course we can't teach people unless they're coming through our doors in the first place and every discussion like this always gets to this point about how do we attract more people of course the geological society has been working on that quite hard and I think it's about listening to people about what people think and then responding to that and making sure we're laying on the courses that they want to do as well as to keep telling them that you must come and join us because we're such fantastic people doing important work and, and somebody raised this problem about you know at Birkbeck where they not going to allow mining companies or something to come to their careers fairs I mean I almost laughed about that if it's only in one university that's fine hey because so long as they come to Exeter University where I am and <laughs> St <Fantastic>. Andrews and <laughs> etc <laughs> that's fine hey and I think but I think this is a really important piece of education is, is that you know mining isn't just coal mining which is what I think people think it is and and that you know these people they're they're passing these resolutions and then they're presumably they're going and getting on a diesel bus and going home you know it's like <laughs> they're not yeah. even thinking so yeah oh, that's a much harder piece of PR isn't it yeah. but that's like yeah so still lots to do 
in that area to make sure we're really listening to young people and uh, making sure that they do want to come and uh, take part in these careers. Uh, thanks, Francis. Again, I'm just coming to the time. So, so Megan, you had a question. Yeah, I guess this is this is a question about uh, the context of the UK's critical mineral strategy and approach in the international space. So, you know, somebody's reflected in the chat box that do we know what out of all of these critical minerals we have resources or, or reserves of in the UK? And how does that affect our place within the international system? Um, because the demand for certain minerals and materials is increasing globally and decarbonisation, for example, driving that is a, an international effort. It's not just a UK effort. Um, and so I have a question for the group uh, about how what this strategy might mean for international position, uh, international relations and international posi position, excuse me, um, and also what it might mean for UK exploration versus imports, exports, and just the wider context of minerals and materials flow um, to achieve some of these big targets that we're aiming to achieve. Okay, thanks, Maggie. Sarah, I'm going to give you one minute to answer that. Okay, so um, with regards to these materials, we're in competition with the rest of the world. We've only got some of them in the rocks beneath our feet and Karen and the BGS is the best source to go to to work out what we've actually got in the ground beneath our feet here. This is where science and technology can actually form one of our main levers into access to the rest of the world because we're really good at working out well, where to go and find this rock, how to dig it out of the ground responsibly, how then to recycle it, etc. And actually yesterday I gave a presentation to the science and technology committee in government, which is something that doesn't get affected by the resignation of the prime minister, which of course has happened within the last half an hour. Things always happen in an exciting way on these webinars. Um, I'll put that into the chat but basically what this means is the, the critical mineral strategy is out there. It includes an awful lot of outreach into that international marketplace as well. Sustainability, of course, is absolutely core with that, as is our scientific expertise. It is bigger than just one leadership regime, if not two. So my hope is don't worry with all of the fluctuations in leadership. This push is big enough to actually make it through into whoever is in charge next week. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. Right. Given the time, I'm going to ask everyone for 30 seconds summary uh, of, of what people should take away from, from the strategy of today. I'm going to be strict with time. So, Sarah, maybe you can just come back in on that. Uh, the time is now. We need all of the inspiration and ideas on the table right now. So pull in all your friends. We've got a big challenge to surmount. Thanks. Great, nice and succinct. Thank you, Richard. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, just very quickly, I, I think we, we need to work out what UK is really good at and focus on those because we and then we can be exporting that to the minerals industry worldwide, frankly. And, uh, you know, we've got a great history, but we've got the ability to to help drive this change through our our intellectual knowledge, really. Great. Thanks. No, excellent. Um, Karen. Yes, we need lots and lots of people who are passionate about sustainability, passionate about our planet, passionate about finding solutions. We need them engaged and we need them knowledgeable about geoscience, not necessarily all geoscientists proper, but, but we need geoscience to be actually part of the decisions of almost everything that we do. And then I think importantly, we have a great strategy now, I think based on an excellent job and they've really, really, upskilled, I think, internally, uh, uh, and, and, and they're very well suited to actually act on it now. We have to remember, we have to act, we have to implement, we have to actually make change and get behind it. And on a positive note, relating a little bit to what Sarah was hinting at, uh, in my experience, this is not a partisan issue. This is actually something that unites people from left to right and center, and that's a really good thing. So let's hope that we are continuing to go down that road, whatever happens. Great, right, thanks for the changing government. And Francis, last, last words from you, please. Yes, so publishing the strategy is just the very first stage. The big thing is implementing that strategy. Um, so if you remember the accelerate, collaborate, enhance, I think there's something there for geoscientists in all three of those parts of the strategy. There's some pure geoscience to be done, some real academic stuff, understanding some wider deposits, and that's available. Don't be too hung up on the definition of critical minerals. Everybody's different. You'll find one some in some country somewhere that suits you. 
but there's a lot of collaborative research. I think that's the other thing we need to do as geoscientists is not be afraid to go and talk to our friends in the recycling world and business and so on and, and join up and find ways to, uh, to enact the strategy and open the doors uh, or go through the doors that have been opened by the publication. Great, thanks Francis. Um, I, I guess we better leave it there. I'd like to thank our panelists again. Um, thank you for giving up your lunch hours and giving us your, your insights. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Megan, for joining us and thanks Amelia and the Joseph team for, for hosting it. And thank you all for, for joining. Pleasure. So until the thank next you. time, bye then. Thank you.